from the College by the Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Local, regional, national, and international guests discussing the issues and topics affecting the way you live are on Forum, the North Idaho College Public Forum, with your host and moderator, political scientist, Tony Stewart. Ladies and gentlemen, our topic for today is the death penalty, ethical or unethical, or constitutional or unconstitutional. This is an issue that's been uh, debated for centuries, and it's a very important question. And of course, there have been many uh, very uh, major cases in recent years that have brought it to the forefront again, particularly here in the United States. We're very fortunate today to have two highly qualified advocates for the two positions in support and opposition to the death penalty. I first would like to welcome to the program a very longtime friend, Glenn Walker who practices law in Coeur d'Alene. He's the former prosecuting attorney of Kootenai County. And in that capacity, he was very successful in criminal prosecutions. He also was able to uh, obtain the first conviction under Idaho's uh, malicious harassment law uh, in getting a conviction against hate crimes. He was well known as prosecuting attorney for having no tolerance for hate crimes. He also is one of the co-authors of the Domestic Terrorist Act, which is one of the anti-hate crime laws in Idaho. Glenn, it's good to see you again, and welcome back to the program. And Glenn is here to uh, support under certain circumstances the death penalty. Our second distinguished guest today is Gardner Hanks. He's from Boise, Idaho, and he is the Amnesty International Coordinator for the state of Idaho. Uh, and in that capacity, he opposes the death penalty. He's recently written a book called Against the Death Penalty with a subheading, A Christian and Secular Arguments Against Capital Punishment. Uh, and uh, Gardner Hanks, welcome to the program. Thank We're you. very pleased to have you here to take the other position today. And as always, I'm so pleased to have two regular panelists that uh, are on the program week after week with me. Uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Vice President for College Relations and Development at North Idaho College. And I shall invite Janelle to commence the questioning with our two guests today. My first question I'll direct toward Glenn. Um, as a former prosecutor and now as a criminal defense attorney, you're very familiar with the procedure in these kinds of cases. Can you fill in for our audience what happens in a, in a capital punishment case? Well, first of all, the, if it is a capital punishment case and the, the prosecutor has to uh, make an election to uh, go for the death penalty, he has to advise in writing the court and uh, uh, opposition that he intends to seek the death penalty. That, that gets it going. And then, uh, of course, if there is a conviction, or a, a plea of guilty, <coughs> then, of course, there has to be uh, an aggravation and mitigation hearing. There are uh, eight or nine or ten statutory aggravating factors that a court uh, may look at. The court must find, beyond any reasonable doubt, that at least one of those aggravating factors exist, and that any mitigating factors uh, are over or are over overcome by the aggravating factors. Usually, to uphold a death penalty, uh, there will be several of the nine or so uh, aggravating factors. There are other aggravating factors besides those statutory factors that a court may consider uh, in deciding to do it. But but it has to come at least one of those nine things uh, beyond any reasonable doubt. Now, just for our viewers, let's clarify. When you're saying court, you mean the judge. Yes, and, I mean the and, judge. And uh, in Idaho, under Idaho's law, the jury finds the person guilty or innocent, innocent or guilty. The jury is responsible for that portion after the trial, and then the judge is the one who actually sentences. That's correct. Does that's, the, that's legalese. We always refer to the court, and we're really referring to the person sitting uh, uh, behind the bench with the robe. And, and that isn't the case in every jurisdiction, but I'll, I'll come back to that a little bit later. I just wanted an example of what might be an aggravating factor. Well, let me, let me just uh, uh, grab a couple from straight out of the code. Um, we are looking at um, the statutory aggravating circumstances of a previous conviction for murder. Uh, at the time of the murder, uh, the defendant commits another murder at the same time. Uh, another one was that the defendant uh, is knowingly creating a great risk of death to many individuals while he's committing this murder. Uh, another one would be the murder is committed for um, remuneration. In other words, a contract killing. Another would be uh, it's a, uh, the uh, killing a murder of a judge or a police officer. <coughs> uh, 
Another one would be uh, simply more general, uh, especially heinous, especially atro atrocious or cruel uh, circumstances. I'm sorry, I'm kind of losing my voice, but I'm, I'm going to get through this thing, do the best I can. And um, another one would be that prior conduct of the defendant shows that he's a particularly depraved person. I'm, I'm kind of generalizing. Um, and uh, uh, there are actually 10 of the statutory aggravating factors. And the last one mentioned uh, would be that the person killed is a um, uh, potential witness in the case. So he, if he goes out and kills somebody who might be a witness against him, that would be uh, those are the kinds of things that the Idaho uh, courts look to. And, and the judge can also uh, consider mitigating factors as well. We're going to have to move on. I know that's the, very interesting to you as lawyers, but we must mm -hmm. move into the issues of death penalty. We'll move on to Steve Sheen. Well, and, and Tony mentioned lawyers, and I feel like I'm surrounded by experts here, a couple of attorneys, a political scientist, a legal advocate, an author. I'm going to take the part of the true layperson like, like I am. Um, I need to back up a little bit. Uh, United States Constitution and, and, and Supreme Court has decided that the death penalty is constitutional in the United States. That's well, correct. What's the jurisdictional uh, uh, level of that? Is that is it, is it decided on a state by state basis? Are there states that don't impose the death penalty, or do all states impose the, the death penalty currently? There are twelve states and the District of Columbia which do not impose the death penalty. Most of those states are in the Midwest, uh, upper Midwest, that have a strong progressive tradition, uh, and in New England. Um, and again, the, the District of Columbia doesn't. And, and in this country, is the, is the state the lowest political subdivision? I mean, it's not a county by county issue or a court by court issue within states. They're always is it? state courts. Okay, all right. It's state law, but I think it's a it's an interesting question because different counties will approach the death penalty differently. Uh, in Idaho, for example, a poor rural county often will not seek the death penalty because it costs so much to prosecute it and to defend it. And um, we've tried to to change the law over the last year or so to to make that even more even, but I'm not sure that that's going to do it. Um, death penalty cases are extremely expensive. If you're a small county without much income, um, you look at this and you say, should we, you know, can we afford this and still do the other things that we want to do? And many times, the small counties will say, no, we don't want to. So I guess the lesson is, if, if you want to, uh, to get away with it, this without a, the possibility of a death penalty, Go to a smaller county. Go to a rural county. I'm going to interject here. I'm going to get us on another track. That, that's fascinating. We've already lost 10 minutes of the program, which is good base, but we need to get into why you came, mm -hmm. and that is the constitutional questions and the ethical questions mm -hmm. about the death penalty itself. And so may I start with uh, our guest from Boise, Mr. Hanks. Mm -hmm. uh, at least in all my readings and research in your book, I was looking at your table of contents. Do you take both positions that it is both unethical to use the death penalty and do you believe it's also cruel and unusual under the Constitution? Or well, I'll put it another way, why, do you, why have you come here today to oppose the death penalty? Well, I do think that it's, uh, it's unethical. Um, I don't think that, that, uh, that you can go around um, making decisions to kill other human beings and say that that's an ethical decision. Um, if we value life, then we can't kill other people. Uh, is it constitutional? Well, the Supreme Court says that it's constitutional. Is it cruel and unusual? I think that there's little doubt that it's unusual, at least according to Western standards, because it, we're the only Western democracy that uses it. Um, is it cruel? I don't think no, no matter what method you use, um, you cannot take away the cruelty of telling someone um, a month in advance that they're going to be killed on a certain day, and then you go through a ritual of moving them towards the gurney in Idaho. And you will lay them on the gurney, you will stick a needle in their arm, you'll have them wait um, while, while certain legal procedures go through. This kind of ritualism, I think, would be considered an aggravating uh, circumstance so, in, in uh, most murders. <laughs> So you would say that uh, you would disagree with the court. I know the courts divide, but you would, would you argue the position under the 8th and 14th Amendment that it is cruel and unusual punishment, that you would, you would like to see the court take the position? I would like to see the court take the position that it is cruel and unusual. Before I go to Glenn and take the other side, let me ask one other question in relation to that, is if that continues to be the position of our courts that it is not cruel and unusual, and that is, by the way, the majority opinion of the, of the American people as well mm -hmm. as the court at this time. Uh, I have a very philosophical question under probably natural law. And that is, uh, would you appeal to a higher law than the Constitution and still contend that it was cruel and unusual punishment, even though you may never prevail within the court? Uh, as a Christian, I, I would appeal to, to the Bible, the biblical 
um, stance, particularly of Jesus, who said, if you are without sin, then you can throw the first stone. And I personally am not without sin, and I doubt if anyone else that I know is without sin. And if that's the case, then you certainly can't have somebody acting as an executioner. You've cut lead up another question, that is, though, there are Christians on both sides of this issue that quote the Bible or too. Absolutely. Yeah. Now let's go to Glenn, and I'll go back to the panel. Uh, Glenn, why would you, I know that you have a definition when you would and would not support the death penalty. Why would you disagree with Mr. Hanks on this issue? Well, I would, <clears throat> again, I would disagree with him on basically everything that he just said with great respect. Uh, first of all, uh, Jesus did make a statement like that, if you're without sin, but uh, that was, he was speaking to individuals, I believe. I do not believe he was speaking to governments. And uh, the Bible also teaches us that we are to follow uh, uh, the, the correct and proper laws of society, uh, you know, uh, unto Caesar, etc. <clears throat> and uh, certainly it, uh, this punishment is cruel, certainly it is unusual, but that has to be taken in context. It has to be, to be unconstitutional, it has to be both cruel and unusual and in a proper context. In other words, uh, any punishment is cruel to a degree. Anybody could argue that, but is it so cruel and so unusual considering what you're being punished for. And, uh, in, and I would argue, uh, and I think most people would in this country, that under certain circumstances the death penalty is appropriate. And under certain circumstances, it's the only penalty that can be appropriate. Therefore, you would not consider it unethical if it was met those criteria. I do not. And, and also, I don't think we're talking about realistically a person being notified in writing one month uh, before a sentencing hearing and that's all the warning he has, that's not the case. You do get adequate notice uh, in advance of, a, of an aggravation mitigation hearing, but these things go on for years, as everyone knows, before anyone is ever put to death. Review by many, many courts, on and over and over again. Janelle Burke. Um, I want to get to some realistic uh, uh, questions about the whole process. Um, what is, are the reasons for the death penalty, uh, Glenn, practically speaking? Well, practically speaking, we have to look at the reasons why the, uh, the, the considerations courts give for any kind of sentence. And, and they are, in general, they are deterrence of uh, people in general from co committing these kinds of crimes and, of course, to deter that person from committing any kind of crime uh, or the kind of crime again. They are to uh, protect society in general, and that is the most important function of a sentencing court or a sentencing judge, but protecting society is the main thing. To, uh, to uh, rehabilitate, if you can, that individual is an appropriate purpose of a sentence and uh, uh, restitution, et cetera. But the main thing in a death penalty case is the issue of retribution. That is, a, a society has been injured, a society has been hurt, a young person, an older person, someone has been taken from society wrongly by another person. And uh, let me read something, if I can, from a, a, a one of the most famous cases in Idaho, State versus Creech, has been bouncing around our courts for many, many years. The case was tried in Wallace, uh, near here. And in the Creech case uh, in uh, 1983, the court stated, um, quoting from uh, uh, Georgia versus, uh, Greg versus Georgia, the U.S. Supreme Court, the Idaho court quoted the U.S. Supreme Court and said that capital punishment is an expression of society's moral outrage at particularly offensive conduct, and that the instinct of retribution is part of the nature of man, and channeling that instinct, and that's the key here, channeling that instinct of retribution in the administration of criminal justice serves an important purpose in promoting the stability of society governed by law. So in other words, if we don't have retribution, if society doesn't feel that the courts will act for them, then society would want to take action themselves. And we would have uh, people going out and trying to kill the individual. And society has to respect the courts. So retribution is a very, very valid part of sentencing. And I'm sure you're going to have a response to that. Well, it seems, first of all, that the only people that we really want to have retribution towards are people who can't afford adequate attorneys. Um, the death penalty is, is applied so unfairly that even the American Bar Association has said that we should have a moratorium until we can apply it fairly. They did that in 1997. Um, so it's not a case of, of the most heinous crimes be getting the death penalty. It's not a case of 
of moral outrage about who gets the death penalty. It's who you are um, and whether you can afford an attorney to defend yourself and, and to some extent who the victim was. We have, we have many cases where victims have been tortured and raped and murdered and um, the moral outrage isn't there to, to get a death penalty because the person was um, lower class or, or uh, a person of color. Um, but if the person's middle class, if the person's wealthy, then, and, and if the defendant is poor or a person of color, then we, wanna, then we want the death penalty. We only want the death penalty under certain circumstances, not under all circumstances, that's for sure. I'm, I am fascinated by this, uh, this uh, balancing of retribution versus deterrence. Um, and I'd never, uh, Glenn, that's, I appreciated that explanation. I hadn't heard that before. But what about the deterrence factor? Is there any demonstrable uh, 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 way of showing that the death penalty, the existence of a death penalty, is a deterrent to capital crime? I, well, go ahead. I think the I think the answer to that is is has been basically debated for a, a number of years, and a lot of study has gone into it. Uh, statistical studies um, really began in the 1840s and and have continued on till now, and. Almost all of those studies have shown that there is no connection between uh, an execution and the murder rate or the other uh, kinds of crimes that we're getting uh, capital punishment. In fact, some of those studies show that the murder rate actually increases after an execution. And I think if you know criminal personality, that makes some sense because a criminal is a person basically who acts on their own, emo on their own emotion without really concern for other people. And uh, if you have an excitement, exciting event like an execution, and unfortunately, executions in our country are basically celebrations of death, um, then people get excited, uh, they go drinking. Um, it's, it stands to reason that the murder rate may, in fact, increase after an execution. I don't say that, that's, that the, the statistical evidence is there for that, uh, but certainly there's as much evidence for brutalization as there is for deterrence. Uh, statistically, and certainly if you look at the psychological and social factors of criminality. Well, let me just say that um, he, my, my distinguished guest is correct. Uh, this debate can't be uh, finished today, and it won't be in the next 10 or 20 years for sure. But uh, it most certainly deters that person uh, from ever committing the crime again, because uh, deterrence has two factors. You want to deter the individual charged uh, with, uh, from, com from committing a similar crime again, and you want to deter people uh, similarly situated. So the debate is whether it, it deters others, and, and I can't say that it does or doesn't, uh, not effectively, nobody can, uh, but certainly it does deter that individual, and that gives a, leads us more back into retribution, which is really the part that the courts hang their hat on when they get to a death penalty case. It, it seems to me that that's a, that's a pretty, uh pretty big leap to say that you can uh, anticipate the future uh, for an individual, um, particularly when the death penalty is not applied fairly. But of course, we always try to anticipate the future for individuals in sentencing, and that's one of the purposes of sentencing too, is to say, okay, is this person likely to commit a similar crime again? In every sentence of any kind, any crime, the judges always look to, is this individual likely to commit a similar mm -hmm. crime again? In every sentence in any part of the world, we always have that consideration, certainly in death penalty cases. I interjected to get us on another <coughs> route. Those other questions were excellent. I got us on another route, but I took so much time. I'm going to go back to the panel and give them more time, so I'll go back to the panel with Janelle Burke. Um, we just were f talking about deterrence, and there's another um, uh, whole, uh, whole factor in this, in this process, and that is the cost, the cost involved in, in keeping people uh, under certain circumstances. Um, Let's start with you, Mr. Hanks, and talk just a little bit about the cost of, of keeping a person incarcerated for, say, the rest of their life. Well, the studies that have been done of um, the cost of capital punishment versus life imprisonment have consistently showed that capital punishment is more expensive. And the reason for that is that you are, are investing a tremendous amount of professional time uh, in trying to get a capital case through the court system. Um, a study in Florida showed that a typical execution, by the time they go through all of the legal process, is going to cost over $3 million. Um, and keeping a person on, um, on death row in Florida costs 
about a third of that at that time. Uh, other studies in, in Kansas and New York and, and California have all shown the same uh, kind of thing. Uh, I think that the, the other question is the social costs uh, of doing this. You know, what, how could that money be spent in, in, in ways that would be more effective in stopping crime? Um, programs for, on child abuse or programs against uh, substance abuse would be much more effective ways of, of deterring crime uh, than capital punishment. Um, Glenn, I'll turn to you, and, and would you also add something perhaps about the, the number of people that accumulate then uh, on a death row when you don't have a process of criminal That was how I was punishment. going to respond. At least I think that was how I was going to respond. I think there are far too many people on death row. There are far too many cases considered for the death penalty than there ought to be. The death penalty ought to be reserved for the most egregious, the most heinous, the most depraved acts. And I believe then in those circumstances it would be appropriate. It is appropriate in those circumstances. We have too many people on death row in our states, too many, far too many people in the state of Idaho. Uh, it would be easier to, to sell the idea, in my opinion, that capital punishment can be a deterrent if we used it in the, in the right times. I think we use it too often. Not, too, not in Idaho, we don't use it too often, but we have too many people there. So we are spending millions and millions of dollars in this state on capital punishment cases that never that, that never uh, comes about. Don't go anywhere. They, they don't sort go of languish. Anywhere. They just languish and they bought, they, they uh, uh, well first of all we have too many laws on the books anyway. We have too many crimes on the books and we have too many people in our prisons period. Uh, so a lot of it needs to be changed. But certainly I agree with you on that. Lisa. Gentlemen, the deterrence uh, which we've already discussed is one of the big issues you hear debated uh, when you talk about the death penalty. The other issue that, that at least I hear most frequently is the, is the question of um, uh, we shouldn't have the death penalty because if we make a mistake and, and uh, execute the wrong person that's just too horrible to consider. I'd, I'd like to hear the, the two of you talk about that aspect of this issue. Well, I think, that's, I think that is a, a very important issue. A couple weeks ago in Chicago there was a a conference in which 75 uh, men who had been on death row had been convicted, um, you know, met together and talked about how to, how to keep people off of death row when they were innocent. Um, there have been uh, books written um, that have documented cases uh, that have shown that people who have uh, been innocent were executed. Um, so it really is a case of, uh, you know, if we make a mistake, and we do execute someone, there's no going back. We can't say, oh, well, you know, we're sorry. We'll make some sort of restitution from the state. We'll give you, you know, $100,000 because that person is gone. And, um, you know, I, I, what I can't imagine, and I guess one of the emotional things for me is to think about what would that person be thinking about as that person was laying on the gurney in Boise and had the needle stuck in his arm what would he be thinking about? Uh, what would his family think about after they had heard, after it had been proved? And the thing is, is that in DNA testing, uh, which is now be, you know, becoming more frequent, we're finding that, that up to 25% of the cases, these are major criminal cases, we're finding 25% of those people are actually shown to be innocent by DNA. So if we're making that kind of, mis that many, many mistakes, uh, we should be we should be looking pretty carefully about whether or not we want to go on with this kind of thing. Excellent, excellent argument. I support all of that. However, that should not obviate the death penalty in all cases, and that goes back to my argument. I believe that we have too many people on death row. The uh, I mentioned the ten criteria of aggravating circumstances that the court must consider, and if any one of those is proven beyond a reasonable doubt, well, wait a minute. There may be one of those. Uh, for example, the person kills a police officer. That's a terrible thing. But standing alone, is that enough? Certainly, in, in my opinion, it is not. It's a, it's a terrible thing, but it's not enough. There ought to be several of those factors. And um, I just don't believe that if you have several of those statutory aggravating factors that are a part of this, and if they are then, if a person has confessed, for example, that he's killed 40 people, um, and, 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 he, and there's clear evidence, and he's been convicted of killing several, and we have cases like that. Should there be no death penalty even for those cases? Certainly not, in my opinion. Well, I guess one, one 
quick comment about <coughs> confessions is that confessions are, are not always um, correct. The Henry Lucas case in, in Texas, for example, many of the people on death row are mentally retarded. They're easily intimidated by police officers. Um, they will do what a police officer tells them to do because that's part of their disability. And so they're likely to confess to crimes or they'll take the fall for other people who are more culpable. That's an excellent point, by the way, but I'm talking about the case where there is the true confession and, the, and there is no doubt about it, where all those good arguments are overcome. I know the panel feels like I could, 30 minutes is just not enough to even get started on this topic and we have some frustration, but you're doing an excellent job, both as panel members and as guests. Uh, but I want to, uh, in the time we have left, Glenn and, and, and also to Gardner, uh, as the time of taping this program, a man has escaped in Texas who was on death row. Glenn, would you use that as an argument? Uh, a lot of people say that we don't have to use the death penalty because they can just be put away for life. Is that an argument for uh, the death penalty, if it meets some of the criteria you talked about? Well, I don't know about that particular case, Tony. I've seen it on the news like everyone else, but I don't know enough about it to say whether it is or not. But does it support your argument that you said a minute ago that uh, certainly one can't repeat if the death penalty is used, if, it's, if it meets the criteria? Well, yeah, it certainly is. That's a part of it, but I don't know whether that person does fit the criteria or not. Sure. Um, and I, I, I just think in every state, Texas especially, there are far too many people on death row. We don't need to kill that many people. And Gardner, uh, back to you in relation to, I understand what you're saying about people being innocent, and they certainly mm -hmm. have been proved that. But to play the devil's advocate again, as I have both ways here, mm -hmm. uh, with this new technology we have like DNA and all, it is so effective and all, would you not have your concern somewhat lessened with the fact that there's less likely to convict the wrong person these days because it has also found those people innocent? Well, my problem is, is that in many cases you have two or three defendants, and who's the most, most culpable? Um, you know, often the person who, who, who's probably the least culpable is the one who ends up confessing and, and appearing to be the, the most culpable. I just don't think that as human beings we can expect perfection from ourselves. I, I guess where we're going to leave this program, I think both of you so much is that people in the religious field are on both sides, people in philosophy are on both sides. Uh, the panel's questions have suggested that they are uh, very strong arguments on both sides, but you have been so articulate and I would suggest to both of you, you'd be a wonderful team uh, to share these thoughts with other audiences in Idaho and other places, and I hope you can come back to our program. It's well, been often, very stimulating. I'm often on both sides of this one. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank Glenn Walker, who has a really bad cold today and a bad throat, and he came in spite of that fact. Ladies and gentlemen, we've tried to discuss with you what's a very, very important issue, and the panel joins me in thanking our guests, and I'd like to invite you to be with us again next week at the same time, when we shall discuss yet another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. The North Idaho College Public Forum was videotaped live from the studios of instructional technology on the campus of North Idaho College for viewing at this more appropriate time. We invite you to join us again next week for another all-new edition of the North Idaho College Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>